Live from New York City, it's The Cube at Big Data NYC 2014. Brought to you by headline sponsor, WAN Disco, with support from EMC, MarkLogic, and Teradata. Now, here is your host, Dave Vellante. Welcome back to Big Data NYC, everybody. I'm with uh, Jeff Frick, my co-host for the rest of the day here. We've been going wall to wall Thursday and Friday. This is theCUBE. The Cube is our live mobile studio. We go out to the events, we extract the signal from the noise. I'm going to make a prediction. I'm predicting that all these disparate Hadoop distributions are going to come together in one unified platform, amazingly. And Brett Rudenstein is here from Wendisco to talk about it. We're laughing because Wendisco has this new product that actually makes things uh, a lot easier to manage. We're going to talk about that uh, in a minute, but Brett, welcome back to theCUBE. It's good to see you again. Thank you, everyone. Yep, good to be here. Good to see you both. So we were talking, you, you said the, the show's good. We're, of course, at the New York Times Square Hilton. Uh, the show's down at the Javits Center. There's a little bit of traffic in between here and there, but uh, what's the show like? Show's uh, really incredible this year. I mean, the traffic that just, you know, general traffic, of course, uh, it's a well-attended show. Uh, traffic at the Wandisco booth has been exceptional. The, uh, exceptional. The discussions that we're having with customers, the problems that we're able to solve for them around the active-active nature of our solution, being able to maximize capacity and utilization in multiple data centers, not just have standby and other resource, really resonating well with the crowd. Um, <laughs> even very interesting, there was a, a talk that Jagain gave uh, just a little bit ago. It was uh, it was yesterday, and I've never seen you know uh, one of those uh, one of those attendance halls with respect to our technology completely full. There pretty much wasn't a seat left in the room, and the questions just kept coming nonstop about you know how our technology works and how it solves these problems. So we had a tremendous amount of interest. We really? So. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, generally speaking, you guys have always said solve a really hard problem, but it's kind of a niche in the Hadoop world. Uh, but you bet that the market's going to come to you. Is it? Is that happening? Yeah, I, I, I think what we've seen is uh, a level of maturation in the in the community, and uh, you know, such that they're they're no longer thinking about the traditional backup disaster recovery. That's certainly an aspect of of what we're capable of doing, but they're now realizing some of the extended capabilities that they get, uh, not only just running active-active, but the ability to have mixed heterogeneous clusters, you know, different capacity of machines running. So, uh, for example, one of the things that we classically see is, you know, some legacy nodes that maybe only have 48 gigabytes of RAM in them, and they're really good for batch-oriented work, but some of the newer stuff that people are bringing online, they're bringing in machines with 128 and 256 gigs of memory. They can't put them in necessarily in the same cluster, so they can put them in this, this concept that we have called a zone, which is just our replication technology, creating a level of isolation and allowing mixed uh, workloads to be able to essentially across the, the clusters, a single unified HDFS, one HDFS namespace, but isolate the work in the individual zones. So, so extending the use case that you'd normally think of for WANDisco and presumably uh, exp expanding the TAM as well, which is always a good thing. Okay, so um, you're a demo guy. You're always showing <laughs> great demos. So I've, we've, we've done several with you now, and uh, they're always really interesting. So what are you going to show us today? Uh, I'm going to show you a couple things. I'm going to show you uh, uh, some new products that we have that uh, we're working on right now. We've got something called Data Center Aware Yarn. So we've got uh, a yarn product that's capable of understanding the best and most appropriate location to run jobs when you have active, active clusters, you have additional capacity. So uh, being able to use that without having to think about which resource should I actually use. So let's talk about why that's important. So YARN stands for yet another resource, resource negotiator for yeah. those of you who really uh, don't follow this stuff uh, in great detail. But <clears throat> the nice thing about what you're talking about is y y if I understand it, I'm eliminating the need to move big chunks of data to places to actually run a job, is that right? Or it's, it's, it's more about the fact that when you have a, a, a replicated, uh, a replicated uh, HDFS, it's the ability to run jobs in either location. Now the question becomes is, which location should I run it in? Now we have another capability of our product called selective data replication, and that's the ability to determine, while we maintain a 100% consistent namespace, the ability to determine whether or not data leaves a particular location. So for reasons of uh, foreign policy regulation, where data can't leave one particular uh, uh, data center, we can selectively choose where that data replicates. When it comes to YARN then, it's important to understand when you run a job that that 
that that yarn resource is uh, is executing in the correct data center. So <clears throat> a good example would be Germany. They've got very strict laws about moving data outside the country. Mm -hmm. So you can ensure that that particular job will be run and the resources run locally. Correct. As an example. Absolutely. Okay. Show us what you got. All right, so uh, if you're looking at my screen, uh, you see a graphing application, probably not dissimilar from some of the graphing applications you've seen in the past. Uh, the only difference this time is that typically the graphs that you've watched from our previous demos, they show name node activity. Uh, in this case, we are showing the memory utilization and the CPU utilization in each of the data centers of the collective uh, node managers. So basically the data nodes, how busy the data nodes are. And as you can see right now, our Oregon data center is not doing much. Our Virginia data center is not doing much. And, and here's kind of the scenario I'm going to play out. I'm going to have a bunch of users come into the system, start executing jobs, and we'll watch the system load balance the work when that's, uh, when that's necessary, uh, when we're at capacity in one of those uh, particular data centers. So let's start off. I'm going to issue um, a little script called user1. And user1 comes in first thing in the morning. They execute a MapReduce job. By the way, all three of these jobs that I'm about to run execute across the exact same data source. It's replicated between the Oregon and Virginia data centers. User one comes in to Oregon. All three of these windows on the right-hand side of my screen, they're all open in the Oregon data center. And so I've kicked off the job, and what you'll notice in a minute is that that job really starts, you'll start to see the memory and the CPU pick up in the Oregon data center. Along comes our user two. And user two starts a job. And you've just started to see a little bit of pickup uh, from user one. User two begins the job. And now we're going to start to, over, we're going to pass that threshold that we've set. I've got it set about 65, 70% or so. If we cross that threshold, then another job that comes into the system should technically move across. And now we're at about 100% resource utilization when along comes user three, also in the Oregon data center. I run the job, and of course I've utilized all of this capacity at this point. So what you'll see is even though I've executed all of these jobs in the Oregon data center, in just a moment, that job will be rescheduled or relocated to run in the Virginia data center, and you'll have a maximum utilization of resource by running jobs across both. Just give that a minute to spin up, and, and you'll effectively see that load balance. Okay, and all this is happening dynamically, obviously. I don't have to manually allocate. And that's exactly the point, is the fact that we've crossed this threshold here. We're at about 100% CPU again, or 100% uh, CPU, we're using up a bunch of memory. Now you see this, this other job just kick up, and we're seeing the balanced utilization. It's, it's a load balancing of job resources and scheduling. So you've been running this, uh, presumably at the booth, uh, and sharing it with, uh, with customers. What, what kind of questions do they ask you when they see this? Um, they ask about, you know, what kind of flexibility do they have? You know, can we, you know, have flexibility to control uh, whether or not, what if we want a job to run in a specific data center and it's okay to wait? Yes, you can do that. They so you have some knobs that you can turn to sure. control. Now, what's, what's happening here? So now you can basically see all three jobs are running and we're utilizing, because the CPU is pretty much fully utilized across both data centers, you can see that the jobs are indeed running across both data centers, despite the fact that I've, uh, I've run it all from the Oregon data center. Now, what's interesting, if you start thinking about yarn capacity queues, these are hierarchical queues where you can say, for my, um, for my mission critical applications, they can take up 70% of the cluster resource. But for less uh, critical applications or for research and development, they can use 30% of the resource. Well, what we can then do is say, if you fill up that small queue, we can spill you over into one of the other data centers and utilize the capacity there. So some really, really interesting use cases come out about being able to control capacity queues, uh, load balance across the capacity queues at a much finer grain, uh, a more granular level of detail. Interesting, so extending sort of the use cases of, of, of for active-active beyond sort of the traditional way in which you think about WAN disco. Yeah, e exactly. And uh, so I'm going to show you one more use case okay. now. And that is you can see all these jobs are pretty much finished with just about, you know, the cluster load on both sides of the, the, uh, of the, uh, of the country, if you will, has dropped down. What about that data sovereignty case that we talked about? What about when data only exists in one data center? So let me open up a, a small window over here. And uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to issue a command that is going to show us, I'm just issuing an ls command about this sovereign data that only exists in one data center. You'll notice I ran it across both data centers. So I ran it in Oregon, I ran it in Northern Virginia, but if you notice, the replica count from the stuff that's highlighted in, in green here 
has three replicas in the North Virginia data center, zero replicas in the Oregon data center. Mm -hmm. So now, if I kick off a job in the Oregon data center, it should automatically switch over to the North Virginia data center because that's where the data lives. And that's exactly what I'm gonna show you. Even though there's plenty of capacity to run the job now, user four comes along and executes their data against that data that only lives in the North Virginia data center. And what you'll see, of course, is despite the fact that there's plenty of capacity in Oregon, the Virginia data center will actually handle this load because that's where the data is. It's selectively replicated only in this location. Okay, so now it's black. talk about what black. customers are black, asking black, you about black, this black, one black, and how black, they're black. planning on using it. Well, the, the first thing is there's, there's, there's a couple of reasons they use selective data replication. The first is that they don't want to replicate data that's unimportant to them, that doesn't need to be replicated. That could be the trash, temporary intermediary files, files that are easy to regenerate, any, any kind of uh, uh, you know, uh, temporary data, if you will. Uh, the next kind of data that they don't want to replicate is that case that we spoke about a few minutes ago, the data that can't leave a country, mm -hmm. can't leave Saudi Arabia, can't leave Venezuela, Germany, as you mentioned. Uh, so this is a very key and crucial requirement of just about every one of our customers is to be able to ensure that when data can't leave a location, that it stays in that location, but that there's still consistent access to it. It's interesting, you know, you, you, you hear a lot about cloud and elasticity and the ability to spin up resources, and essentially you're bringing that type of, of agility to your world. And these could be on-premise, they can be in the cloud, you don't really care, right? Absolutely. Oh, interesting. And it really brings out that kind of ability to do things like, uh, you know, to really r sort of recognize the, the, data, uh, the data reservoir, if you will. You have, you know, these other bodies of water, if you will, the d you know, data streams uh, for sending data to a location, data tributaries for as feeder sites to bring data into mm -hmm. another location. We can really take that analogy a long way because we can really create the data ocean with, uh, with our active And the key is the same data source, it's consistent in all cases. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Uh, I've got one more short demo okay. if you're interested. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, the last demo, of course, is uh, this unification uh, layer that you uh, that you uh, made reference to when we started. <laughs> uh, uh, and maybe the, the it, this is a very short demo. It just take a few seconds, but maybe the the first thing to to do really quickly is to just show you a name node UI. Uh, you can see I'm on a machine here called One Hadoop Six. That's the name of that machine. You can see you're looking at the name nodes web UI, uh, but you can probably recognize from the top blue banner that's colored in that nice dark blue color, you probably realize that you're looking at a Cloudera CDH name node web UI. Now I've got another machine here, it's called One Hadoop One. Uh, this is machine one over in the North Virginia data center, and you notice it's a name node web UI, but it has a green banner across the top indicating that it's running HDP. So I've got two different clusters, the same uh, data locales, Northern Virginia and Oregon, one running CDH, one running HDP, and the demo is going to be as follows. It'll be a very short demo. I'm going to open up this uh, this window here, and we're just going to run a quick job. I'm going to create this job here. So it's just going to be a quick MapReduce job called the Cube. And when this job completes, what you'll see is that all of the data blocks replicate from the uh, North Virginia side to the Oregon side in the same active, active capacity that we brought you with the, with the non-stop Hadoop product, you now have the ability to do active, active, uh, uh, active, active configurations for across multiple uh, distributions. <coughs> okay, so, uh, and, and this works for any of the major distros or all the distros? Or? Well, again, this, this product is, uh, is, is still being built, so, uh, mm. you know, this, this will likely come out first across, you know, the, the major uh, distribution vendors, but effectively it's a way for us to include any distribution anywhere. That's powerful, great. All right, Brett, anything else you got, you got for us? Or? No, I, I guess the, maybe the last thing is just to kind of show you that the replication actually occur, uh, occurred. Okay. I'll, do a quick, uh, I'll do a quick LS on the two directories between the two data centers. Uh, so let's just do an LS on web logs, Terra, in, cube. And see that the data was actually replicated across those two locations. And uh, that's what I have for you. Or pick the right location, of course that always helps. Uh, other questions, uh, Dave? 
So uh, you said that this is a, this is a product that's in beta now, is that right? It's uh, technically in alpha right now. It's in alpha, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, can you share with us the rollout schedule or the plans? Or um, you know, it's, uh, we've got a number of requirements to address. We'll probably start seeing this uh, next year, probably in the Q2, front, uh, Q2 time frame. Excellent. All right, and Brett. The, and there it is, uh, just as a kind of last thing, data replicated across the two clusters. It worked. <laughs> of course. You've <laughs> never had a demo fail on us. Unlike Bill Gates. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> All right. All right, Brett, thanks very much. Thanks, for guys. Always high good to see you. Always a pleasure. Thank you. Cheers. Stop, Mike. All right, keep it right there, everybody. We'll be right back with our next guest right after this.